I'm, I'm now going to switch gears into talking a, a little bit about um, how we integrate phenotyping. So one of the messages that I, that I want to leave you with is that, in, in my opinion, um, we need to be more objective and quantitative in our phenotyping. Um, I definitely think that's true for the tomato community, but I, but I also believe that it's true for the potato community. Um, and as, as part of that, because we're also talking about creating databases that can be used over a longer period of time, we need to start thinking about linking our phenotypes to ontologies. In other words, creating um, phenotypic categories that facilitate storage in databases. Um, the genotyping I'll, I'll cover a little bit in terms of SNPs and sequencing. Um, this is an area where, where technology is changing. So, you know, we've talked about the Infinium arrays that have been developed, but it's getting to the point where genotyping by sequencing is, is almost going to be more cost effective. Okay. Um, and so, you know, again, what I want to emphasize is as breeders, what we need to be thinking about is the population size and experimental designs that we use. Um, so then the next step is linking phenotype to sequence variation and then finally using this information for selection. Now the reason that I've put three of these categories in green is because as breeders, if we concentrate on those areas, we know we can make progress. Okay? And so some of the influence of genomics will help us to make traditional breeding more efficient even if we ignore the genotyping and the map-based work. Okay, so that's a message that I want to leave you with. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do now is talk a little bit about e evaluation and phenotyping, and I'm, I'll talk about some specific examples in tomato, but it's, it's the general concept that I want to leave you with about trying to make our phenotyping more objective and more, more quantitative. Okay, so what I want to point out is that, that genomics has introduced this concept of storing data for communities, right? And it's now gotten to the point in, in human genetics and genomics where there is an emphasis on also storing phenotypic data. That's gonna, that, that trend is moving rapidly into plant sciences and plant breeding. It's going to get to the point it's sometime in the near future where if you, if you want to publish a mapping study, as an example, you are going to have to make your phenotypic data available in some sort of a database format. Okay? It's important for us to recognize that. But more importantly, from a breeding perspective, having archived phenotypic data is going to give us more power to work across years and environments. Okay. So if we're going to be storing data, it requires that we agree upon criteria and scales. And what I've done in this slide is kind of take a historical perspective and, and look at different types of objective phenotyping. So if we, if we look at the, the system that, that the National Plant Germplasm System uses in GRIN, it's a one to nine classification system for all data. Um, so for traits such as color, um, we would assign a numerical variable that matches the color. So one is green and two is yellow. All right. Um, that, that's, that's okay to a certain extent, but there's some flaws with it if you think about quantitative analysis. Now, that descriptive system, descriptor system is also used for attributes for fruit shape, just like it is for tuber shape and size, right? And so, you know, a one might be assigned to flat, a two to round, three to ellipsoid, et cetera. The, the problem with these systems is that there's not necessarily any kind of a linear relationship, right? So one plus two does not equal three, okay? Which then affects the kind of statistics that we can do on these data. Um, so more recently, there have been systems that have been developed that are objective, but also quantitative, um, so that the measurement can be interconverted and data can be obtained very efficiently. I'm going to give you some examples of these. So the, the other important thing about having really truly objective data, not scaled data, is that the estimates of variation that are obtained are also very meaningful in terms of estimates of heritability. Okay. So in, in the case of tomato um, fruit shape and fruit color, um, 
Esther Vandernap's group has, has developed the tomato analyzer software, which works off of scanned images and then can collect um, highly objective data that can be used to look at attributes of size, shape, and color. Um, and, and it turns out that these attributes can then be overlaid very nicely with the UPOP descriptors. You can, you can quantitatively show that, okay, of the eight original classes, seven of them are quite robust statistically. All right. Um, my group has spent a lot more time looking at color because that is a trait that has an economic value. Um, and so instead of using a one is green, two is yellow type of system, we've worked off of quantitative systems. Um, we've, we've tended to work more with the universal C-Lab LAB system, um, but we've done work to convert the computer-based RGB into that in, in a way that gives us very good linear correlations. So we can collect data from different parts of the tomato fruit. Um, we get good linear correlations between different color systems, and it gives us very, very objective measurements that we can then use for selection purposes. Okay. Now, furthermore, this data can then be organized in a way that facilitates retrieval as well as placement into databases. Okay. And so what I'm showing with this screenshot is the ontology browser at the, the Solanaceae Genomics Network, or STN. Um, and you can see the Solanaceae phenotype ontology in about the middle. I'll get my mouse right there. Okay, and if you click on that, you can see some of the different um, ontologies that are there. You can click on fruit, fruit color, um, and then different aspects of where the color is measured. And finally, you can, you can scroll down to, say, average hue as a trait. Okay, so the traits we collect are database. Now, this is what it actually looks like when we collect it into a template, right? So it's, it's a flat file. Um, it's linked to an image, um, there's some information on experimental design, and then all of the traits that we're collecting are linked back into the ontology for databasing purposes, right? Um, and so units are there, all the information we really need is there. Okay, and then again, one of the principal questions we're interested in asking is, with this kind of data, is there in fact the genetic signal? Right? Are we working with a heritable trait? Right? And if the answer to that is yes, then we have something that we can make breeding progress on, whether we're working with markers or not. Okay. All right. And I, and I think that the, um, the Eastern United States evaluation trials are a good example of a nice start with a database that's going to serve the potato community well. And what what I specifically want to mention about a database like this is that you're going to have, you're going to build up a multi-year data set. And this multi-year data set is not always going to have the same set of genotypes. It will have overlapping genotypes. But by using the, the power of, say, um, BLUPS, you will be able to do marker trait analysis on these multi-year data sets. And so if the, if the varieties that are in this trial are genotyped on a yearly basis, only the new ones, of course, because you don't have to keep re-genotyping, you're going to build up a data set that then serves you well as essentially a training data set to look at marker trait associations and models for genome-wide selection. Okay? But it's, it's very important to think hard about the data that's going into the system, making sure that it's standardized across locations and as quantitative as possible. And, and really your model for this is to look at what the dairy industry does, right? Where, where yield is measured in gallons per day per cow, and that can all be linked back through pedigrees to specific dams and bulls. And you can predict the performance of a bull. You can, you can say that this bull is likely to produce progeny with this sort of a milk yield. Right? Um, so that, that's the, the beauty of this kind of a system. Okay? 